All right. In ceramics, there's something called an aliovalent substitution. We care about these because these are substitutions that you can make to intentionally create certain types of defects in your crystal that you want. An aliovalent substitution is one where you swap in a new cation or anion for the host one, but it has to have a different charge than the host anion or cation. So let's do an example. How about zirconia? ZrO2. Since each oxygen is 2 minus, that means that your zirconium must be 4 plus, right? It's a 4 plus cation. So the question is, what happens if we take out a zirconium right, atom and we put in an yttrium atom? And the yttrium atom is an yttria 3 plus ion, right? So we're putting an yttrium 3 plus ion on a zirconia, zirconium 4 plus site, right? That's what's happening. So what will this cause the crystal to, to be? Well, we know that electroneutrality has to be maintained, and yet by putting a 3 plus on a 4 plus site, now the, it's overly negative. So we have to fix this by one of two ways. If it's overly negative, then we have two options. One, we can add positive. What would that look like? Adding positive means that we're going to stuff extra cations into the structure as interstitials. Um, you can put things in interstitial sites, but it tends to cost more energy because you're crowding things around the lattice more so. So that's less likely. So instead of adding more positive cations, what else could we do? We could take away some of the negative. If we remove some of the negative, what does that look like? It means that instead of having two oxygen sites filled, we're now going to have some of those oxygen sites vacant, right? So the structure, or the formula is going to look something like this. Zirconium right? And now it's going to be 1 minus x, yttrium x. So for every yttrium that we add, we're going to take out a zirconium, hence 1 minus x and x. And then oxygen is going to be 2 minus something. Now the question is how much? How much oxygen do we need to remove, right? Well, for every yttrium on a zirconium site, we're 1 excess negative charge, right? So if we removed a whole oxygen, that would now put us at two uh, that we're removing, and therefore we would become excess positive. That is, that's not good. So it needs to be for every two yttrium substitutions, we make one oxygen vacancy, right? Each yttrium gets us minus one, right? So if we build up two of those, then we can get rid of that two minus by taking out an oxygen. So it's going to be however many your, your yttriums are divided by two. So this would be the defect composition, right? Now, why on earth do we do all of this? That seems like a lot of effort to go through. We do this because defective crystals can have really interesting properties, right? Take um, yttria stabilized zirconia, right? When you do this, you introduce lots of oxygen vacancies. What are those oxygen vacancies good for? Lots of things. For one, they reduce the thermal conductivity. They call this crystal YSZ, yttria stabilized zirconia. Anyways, YSZ has a really low thermal conductivity because of these oxygen vacancies. They scatter the things that carry the heat, the phonons, the lattice vibrations that carry heat through the structure. We'll learn more about this later in a future chapter, but uh, these get scattered by vacancies, so that's one thing it can do. Well, what else can it do? Well, if you look at a structure like YSZ that has lots and lots of vacancies in it because you've doped it with yttrium, this is what it might look like. In the structure, Right? You've got lots and lots of atomic sites for those oxygens. But because we doped it, what we've done is we've introduced lots of vacancies in this structure. All of those represent oxygen vacancies. What this allows you to do is transport oxygen ions through the structure. So if you have an oxygen 2 minus ion, it can hop through the structure using these vacancies which is pretty amazing. We use this in lots of stuff. In your car, if you have a car that's not super duper old, it has electronic fuel injection, right? So how does this work? What it does is it determines the ratio, the precise ratio of air to fuel that your coal, that your car needs at any given time to make sure that you're not uh, wasting fuel by not burning it or by burning not enough fuel, right? It gets just right that ratio. So how does it do that? Well, what it wants to do is it takes a look at your exhaust gas, right? So from your motor, 
out comes this affluent gas, right? Your exhaust gas. So in that exhaust gas, you would like the partial pressure of oxygen to be as close to zero as possible. You really want to burn up all the oxygen. You don't want to have excess fuel uh, or excess air. So you want your partial pressure of oxygen to be close to zero, right? That has some partial pressure of oxygen. So how do you measure that partial pressure of oxygen? Well, you stick a little, uh, you stick a, a sensor into it like this. So this is your sensor. That sticks into the exhaust pipe of your car. And you have, on the outside you have air, right? So PO2 out here is equal to 0 0.21, right? 21% of air is oxygen. But in your sample gas, this is where your exhaust goes, you would like it to be as close to zero as possible. So if there's no oxygen on the inside of that little tube and there's lots of oxygen on the outside, then there's a driving force because there's a difference in concentration. It's going to want to go from the outside air into your sensor by traveling through this barrier. If that material is made out of stabilized zirconia, right, the same thing that we just talked about, zirconia that you've put some yttrium into it, it will have oxygen vacancies, then you can actually get oxygen traversing through that barrier and you'll be able to measure what the partial pressure is inside your exhaust gas. Now, how do you do that? How do you measure that? With our old friend, the Nernst equation. Let me show you an example of a fuel cell because it's the same concept, but it's a little easier to see. Why do we care about fuel cells? Um, they're making some really cool things possible. Right now, you can buy a car like the Toyota Mirai or the upcoming Nikola Badger, um, which has fuel cell technology embedded into it. What's interesting about the Badger is it has battery and fuel cells. So you can get 300 miles on battery, and then you can get an additional 300 miles on fuel cell. So overall, the range becomes 600 miles, right? That's a lot better than the 300, which a lot of vehicles do because it takes advantage of these fuel cells. So what is a fuel cell and how do they work? Well, here's what they look like. This is an example of a solid oxide fuel cell. So you have to provide hydrogen. You probably know that, that these vehicles require hydrogen filling stations. So you have a source of hydrogen, and then you have a source of oxygen. The oxygen is just air. Right? So on this side, you just have air, right? which is wonderful. Over here, you've got H2 gas. Now what happens, if you put those on both sides of a membrane that doesn't allow gas to cross it, right? so gas cannot go across that. right? Gas molecules cannot. If you put them on both sides of it, what will happen is they realize, right? these atoms realize, hey, if I could just get across this barrier, the oxygen could meet up with the hydrogen and form H2O water molecules, right? And we know that um, the reaction of hydrogen reacting with oxygen to form water is thermodynamically favorable. We can calculate it. It has a really low change. It has a very negative change in Gibbs free energy. Therefore, these atoms want to cross that barrier. However, the only way that they can cross that barrier, because this is made of zirconium, because it has that same material that we talked about previously, where it has oxygen vacancies, the only way that the oxygen can travel across that barrier is by picking up electrons. So here's your electrons coming in. You've got electrons coming in over here. They combine with the oxygen. On this side of the equation, you've got oxygen. All right, let's do a half of a molecule of oxygen, picking up two electrons to form oxygen two minus, right? Over here on the other side, what do you have happening? Well, you've got hydrogen gas coming in. Hydrogen gas is going to give up that electron, right? So you've got H2 molecules. They are turning into hydrogen molecules by giving up one of their electrons. So if you have two of those, then you have two electrons, okay? We could combine those two reactions and it looks as follows, right? So those are two half cell reactions. When we combine these two together, this is what we get. H2 plus 1 half O2 gives us H2O, right? So in order for that to happen, you have to have this flow of electrons. They have to flow this way through the circuit. You have to have oxygen 2 minus ions traveling through the material, right? So from there, we could write down what the Nernst equation for this would be. That would say that the voltage that we would observe, right, the, the cell voltage which you would get out of this device is going to be equal to delta V naught minus RT over NF. Then it's going to be products over reactants multiplied by the natural log of the reaction quotient products over reactants. So the products are partial pressure of water, 
partial pressure of H2O divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen multiplied by the partial pressure of oxygen to the one half. All right? So this is how you can get a voltage out of these things is that if you keep on providing a source of hydrogen, you're going to get oxygen from the air. These are going to combine across there and you can generate electricity, right? Which will travel through some sort of load. That could be the engine, right? The motor for your vehicle. That's how fuel cells work. So the last thing to, to ask about this is, um, let's do some examples. What, what other sort of defect reactions can we form if you dope it with other aliovalent choices? Let's look at this one. What happens if you have niobium 5 plus, right, ions, and you're going to put them in a titanium oxide lattice, right? So first off, would it be substitutional or interstitial? Well, niobium 5 plus is a high charge, so it might be a small ion, but if you look it up, it's actually relatively large still, and so it's about the size of titanium, so it's probably going to be substitutional, right? So it's going to substitute out a titanium, right? So what type of defect will it form? Well, all right, titanium is... 4 plus in this structure, right? Because it's got 4 minus from the oxygen, so it's 4 plus. So we're putting a 5 plus on a 4 plus site. Therefore, this has excess positive charge. So just like before, we have options for fixing this excess positive charge. We can either add negative charge or remove positive charge. It's never a good idea to add something because that means stuffing more atoms into a usually already crowded space. It's always uh, more uh, energy efficient to remove something. So we're going to remove positive charge. So what would it be? All right, the formula was TiO2. Now it's going to be Ti, let's do 1 minus X. Niobium is going to be X, oxygen 2. Now that is still overly positive, so we have to remove more. So how much do we have to remove? Well, for every one titanium that gets replaced with a niobium, we have excess positive charge. But if we remove a titanium charge, we take away four at a time, right? So we're going to get one from the substitution, and then we're going to have to, for every four substitutions, we can remove another titanium, right? So there you have the formula. We could combine that further to get that the new defect formula would be titanium, 1 minus 5 fourths x niobium x oxygen 2. All right, that would be the new defect formula for this example of an aliovalent substitution. So, whereas when we doped it with something that had less charge than normal, a 3 plus on a 4 plus site, it created an oxygen vacancy. This time, since we put something that has a higher charge, 5 plus on a 4 plus, it created a cation vacancy. We're ending up with cation vacancies. So that's an example, a couple examples of aliovalent substitution and how we can use them as material scientists to end up with structures that have properties just like what we're looking for.